On May 12, 1973, David Bowie and the Spiders from Mars landed at Earl's Court Exhibition Center in London. It was part of the legendary Ziggy Stardust tour, and I was a Bowie infatuated American student living abroad. Scoring tickets to the show was a dream come true. So on the day of the concert, my best pal Marilyn and I, I blasted the Ziggy album all day as we tried to glam up for the show, donning shiny Lurex sweaters, platform shoes, and smudges of Biba eyeshadow. Stepping on to the two, we ran into dozens of kids from across England, Germany, France, and the Netherlands. So they were all similarly decked out for the pilgrimage. We had found our, our element and clearly it transcended borders. Our seats were like halfway back on the venue floor, but the moment the band launched into the opening bars of Ziggy Stardust, I was, for the first time ever, compelled to rush the stage. Remember doing that? <laughs> I needed to get closer to the magic that while we were spinning into existence. I sensed that there might be a place inside the music where each moment would unfold entirely differently than the one before. And it did. I was immediately awed by the theatricality, how the makeup and costumes and vibe rolled into an ever-changing singularity with the music. There was something, though, in the way that Bowie moved his light body, swung his shoulders, his hips, his chest, made shapes of the space between his hands and the arms that teased the pull of gravity and made him seem much more like a dancer or maybe even a mind than a musician. I was captivated. This was not typical rock and roll. The evening flew by in a flash, and as soon as the last notes of rock and roll suicide brought the concert to a close, it took a moment to settle into a new reality one incorporating David Bowie in the flesh. While the reviews insisted that the sound at Earl's Court was terrible, I had no idea what they were talking about. For 11-year-old me, the show was like a flawless passage into a world forever changed. During the next few days, though, one particular element kept poking at me. Before moving to the UK from Los Angeles, through most of the high school and my first year in college, I was really interested in guerrilla and the avant-garde theater and dance. I performed for a while with an outfit called the Dennis Mind Troupe. As a child, I had seen Marcel Marceau at UCLA and my fascination with the illusions he created, the suspension of physical reality, stuck. And seeing how we tapped into those same memories. A few days later, I came across an article in The Melody Maker, one of England's most popular paper, music papers, about a dancer, mine, and Commedia dell'arte actor named Lindsay Kemp. Show and tell. That is Lindsay. The story said that Bowie met Lindsay, a performer 10 years his senior, in 1966 at a dreamy, circus like performance in Covent Garden. The two were immediately drawn to one another, and Lindsay not only became a major creative influence, but Bowie's devoted friend, lover, dance, and mind teacher. It led to their collaborating on the choreography for Ziggy Stardust, Lou Reed and Iggy Pop hanging out at rehearsals, also absorbing Lindsay's style. 
most enticing, though, the article mentioned that Lindsay had a school with classes that were open to the public. I had to chase it down. Within the hour, I found a phone number and booked for later in the week. I was going to study with the same teacher as David Barrio. My closeted proclivity for mine felt a tad less nerdy. <laughs> I took a train from my college in Richmond, Surrey, to Oval in South London to join a chaotic collection of beautiful actors, dancers, would-be David Bowie's already posing before a large mirror, practicing climbing invisible ladders, walking in place, swimming through the air, and interacting with one another at a rubbery distance. Their seriousness and self-absorption bordered on absurdity, and initially, it was really hard to restrain, restrain my laughter. <laughs> Nonetheless, I was terrified to enter the mix. Feeling like a rather unextraordinary little American girl dressed in flared jeans and an embroidered peasant top, I found a corner to drop my things and gradually slowing down, found the rhythm of the room and tiptoed into the edge of their strangely seductive sun flow. After the class started with a series of warm-ups, we were told to pay specific attention to the negative space between parts of our body as we moved, to notice the shapes that our hands, our legs, torso, and head made in relation to one another. Notice how they shifted as we moved, how and where our weight settled and lifted quality of the ground below, where the momentum of movement led, daring us to dive into it. Truth be told, Lindsay Kent didn't actually show up as our teacher that day. I suppose he was too busy sharing the Bowie star line. So we learned from another instructor, an exotic male model type of protege. It wasn't until my third and final class, you know, student budgets, all that, um, that the master appeared in all his flamboyant kimono clad glory, <laughs> living gracefully, gleefully, student to student, making small adjustments to our postures and movement, whispering in our ears. I still felt conspicuously inconspicuous among my fabulous classmates, but I will never forget the feel of Lindsay's hands on my body and his imploring me to boldly embrace and become my movements, to push past them, dance into every inclination, risk everything. He was magical, sensual, almost otherworldly being. As the years moved on, in every Bowie show I saw, and there were many, I could see Lindsay Kemp reverberate through the choreography, punctuating each song, the gestures between them. Bowie never appeared inauthentic or overly rehearsed, but Lindsay's infusion of body awareness clearly took root and became a dimension of his work. Lindsay installed that same magic into Kate Bush, adding a unique signature of physicality to her performance. I heard that Peter Gabriel and Vivian Stanshell would go by to learn and experiment with them. I still find it fascinating that Lindsay worked with so many of my favorite artists, leaving surreal fingerprints on them all. In my own life, all these years later, on those odd occasions that I think of it, like now, I still become hyper-attuned to the shapes I make in my body and the placement of weight, even if I'm the only one who ever notices in those moments, I secretly push the boundaries of movement, of physicality, and if I look carefully, I can just sense a trace of Lindsay's enchantment 
in my own psyche. Thank you.